Why is what we did at Dartmouth 50 years ago so great? Well, let me think about it a second. Computing was coming into its own, but in all of the other projects that were undertaken by industry and by universities, uh, the target was research and development of computing ideas and so forth. Whereas here at Dartmouth, we had the crazy idea that our students, our undergraduate students, who are not going to be technically employed later on, you know, so, uh, social science and humanities students, should learn how to use the computer. Completely nutty idea. So it's um, around 1952 or 53. Don Morrison, who was dean of the faculty at Dartmouth under Johnson and Dickey, was worried about the math department at the time. It contained a, more than the usual number of professors that were just about ready to retire, and they were all the, the old school of mathematics. Don Morrison happened to know Al Tucker at the math department in Princeton. And so he called Al Tucker, and Al Tucker says, I think I know the guy you need. John Kemeny was born in Hungary before the Second World War. He was a Jew, lived in Budapest. His father happened to be in the export-import business and had connections outside of the country. So when the dark clouds over Europe began to form, uh, John's father saw the handwriting on the wall and got the family out of Hungary. Their possessions didn't make it. It was that close. So he spoke essentially no English um, because of his grades gets put into a sophomore of a huge, huge, um, not very good school and three years later at 16 is valedictorian. You know, over the uh, next 10 years, he goes from being an undergraduate to being a, a professor at Princeton, including his time at Los Alamos, including working with Einstein, and manages to do his army service in the middle of all this, gets his thesis uh, completed at age 23. I mean, an outrageously accelerated um, time, extraordinarily rich period of his life. And Don Morrison said, what I want to do is to bring you to Dartmouth and give you a completely free hand to rebuild the math department. My father is pretty sure that Einstein and von Neumann recommended him to Don. So he arrives on the Dartmouth campus in 1954. And so we have derived the mean value theorem of the integral calculus. P.H. Brown it was an old roly-poly guy, been around at Dartmouth a long time. He's alleged to have rolled his eyes like this and said, Things are going to be different around here. <laughs> and Lord knows they were. <laughs> John von Neumann uh, was one of the many Hungarians who immigrated to the United States just in time and contributed immensely to the scientific discoveries in this country. My father attended a lecture of von Neumann's at Los Alamos, and it's described in his book, Man and the Computer, and he thinks it's the only place that lecture was written up. And in it, von Neumann lays out the principles of what a modern computer should be, that it be electronic, that it have an internal program, uh, and that it could, have a, you know, could remember instructions, that it could do X, Y, and Z. And my father distinctly remembers thinking, God, I hope I live long enough to see such a thing. Kemeny was back at Princeton recruiting, and I was in statistics at Princeton, not, ma not straight mathematics. And he was interested in getting somebody in statistics. I thought, well, I don't know. I, I had no idea what I was gonna do for a life's work. But I remember saying to my wife, well, maybe I'll try teaching at Dartmouth. There was essentially no computing at Dartmouth. There was nothing close by. And Kemeny 
he, in his expansive mode, he wanted to get into the new things in, that were going on in the world. And about that time, uh, MIT got a machine, I think it was called the 704, and uh, he made contact with MIT fairly early. They were, I think, somewhat anxious to reach out to other schools. So my job was to act as a liaison between Dartmouth and the MIT Computer Center. And it involved uh, taking punch cards, and everything was punch cards in those days, uh, and put them into a steel box and going down once every two weeks to MIT. This involved getting the 620 train out of White River Junction. And I did that every two weeks, went down to MIT and put the punch cards into the input hopper of the computer center and hung around for two or three hours until the printout came out and then and then took that, all that junk back up to uh, Dartmouth. Well, I figured out that the data transfer rate, you know, we talk about gigahertz and all this kind of stuff, was 1.67 bits per second. That was the data transfer rate. It was a very slow process. After a couple of years, John Kemeny decided maybe it's time to get our own computer. So this is about 1958. So at that time, the, uh, math, the Bradley Mathematics Building was in the works. How can we get a computer into the new Bradley Building? There's no budget for it. Ah, but there's budget for furniture and furnishings. Ah, a computer is a furniture, right? Yeah, okay. So that's how it was decided. That's how they figured out how to pay for the LGP30. The main reason to get the LGP30 was the time matter and the fact that it took all day to get a program done at MIT on a big machine. You could do things on the LGP30, which is a quite small machine, but you could get results immediately. So the LGP30 arrived, I don't know when, it was sometime in 1959, before the building was completed. And so we had to uh, put it somewhere, and we put it in the basement of College Hall, and John Kemeny got the Science Foundation to provide money to support undergraduate research assistantships at Dartmouth because we didn't have any graduate students. Well, the background of this is, in 1957, Sputnik went up, okay? You remember Sputnik? You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. One of the great scientific feats of the age. And the United States scientific community went zonkers, okay? So the National Science Foundation developed all kinds of programs to support science instruction in the universities, graduate level and undergraduate level. Kemeny was Johnny on the spot, and he would go to places like the Bronx High School of Science and recruit students to come to Dartmouth if they were good in math. I mean, the coaches recruit football players, Kemeny recruited students. One of the people who was new in the fall of 1960 was George Cook, who was a, a person Kemeny had specifically recruited. George's job was to prepare a program in connection with the 1960 presidential election. The, the idea was the LGP-30 would be used to predict New Hampshire on the basis of the initial returns. On election night, he was in the computer center in the basement of College Hall, and I tagged along to watch. So I watched over his shoulder as he did all of these great things and produced all of these numbers. And so I think we were up all night in the room with the LGP-30 running the state in as was well coming in from the WDCR reporters. And making these predictions. The headquarters of the major television networks are equipped with entire batteries of tabulating machines and with electronic computers to forecast the trend of the election on the basis of early return. My memory is that at 9.30 that evening, the um, LGP-30 made a prediction of who was going to win in New Hampshire and NBC made the opposite prediction. I, I don't know which way that went, but I do know that the LGP-30 was correct. I remember uh, Bob Hargraves was a physics student. 
but he wrote a very interesting program. Uh, basically, it was a higher level language interpreter. DART was an attempt, and it was a successful attempt, to put together a language not quite as good as Fortran, but a simple enough language that one could do arithmetic, like A equals B plus C divided by seven, or have a square root, or something of like that. So, and I put together an idea for that kind of a language and actually wrote a whole compiler for the LGP30. And I remember going to a couple of meetings for the Royal McBee LGP30 Users Conference and that sort of thing, and they were all sort of surprised that you could do things like that on the little machine that they had used uh, as one step up from the tabulators in order to calculate insurance premiums and things like that. After I got that one done, Steve Garland came and he said, gee, Hargraves can do Dart, I can do Algol, <laughs> which was a much more difficult language. And uh, he did indeed make Algol run on the LGP-30. Tom primarily had the idea that it was important to have a higher level language running in the LGP-30. And so the question was not whether there should be one, but which one should it be? So there certainly was a lot of uh, respect in the emerging computing community for this language Algol 60. But I think the biggest impact of it was that it showed Tom and also John Kennedy that you could make computation available to undergraduates in an undergraduate course, and they could use it to enhance their learning. And so that prompted Tom and John to think about how can we make it more widely available? How can we accommodate more students? At one point, I can remember being down at MIT. I was still going down to MIT once in a while. John McCarthy, famous in artificial intelligence, had been at Dartmouth and went to MIT because they had better computing facilities at the time that he went. And he said, um, you guys should do time sharing. Said, okay. You know, what was time sharing? So time sharing was an idea. Instead of running one job to completion and then putting the next job in, was a way of running one job for one second and then doing something so that the next job can get in, running it for one second, and next, the next job, the third job for one second. Choo, 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 choo. In this way, if you had a small job, you could get the results quickly. And if you had a big job, you had to wait, just as in the old days. Well, all we had was the LGP-30 at the time. We can't do time sharing in the LGP-30. It's just too small a machine, and the input-output is just too difficult. So I came back to uh, Dartmouth, and I talked to John Kemeny, and I said, John McCarthy thinks we ought to do time sharing. So Kemeny said, OK. Well, at, at some point, the notion was raised that, that Tom and I would go to Phoenix to um, well, as I understood it, try to talk GE into giving us a free computer. I didn't know how the trip to Phoenix was supposed to result in a computer being handed over to Dartmouth, but uh, their airplane ride was long and I had a lot of chance to talk to Tom Curthy. I think as I reconstruct matters, it must be that on the airplane, I jotted down something in the way of a block diagram, how this might work. GE couldn't have cared less of what, how we were going to do it. We were treated as customers. So uh, that was kind of a, an experiment that led nowhere. We decided to do the right thing and invite other companies to submit proposals. And the companies were IBM, General Electric, of course, uh, National Cash. Uh, Bendix and uh, Burroughs, I believe. So it turned out that the, the GE uh, proposal was much more uh, in line with what we were planning to do. Not only was it the best equipment for our purposes in terms of what it could do architecturally, but it was also the cheapest. So it was a non-issue. And we put in a letter of intent to GE in the summer of 1963, sometime or other in the fall. At that time, the NSF was uh, funding uh, purchase of computers by, by universities. So we put the proposal in, and for the computer purchase proposal, we were going to develop a time-sharing system using undergraduate students as programmers. 
And the peer review was, hey, you can't have undergraduate students writing software for a major computing system. Fortunately, Kim and he had such good relations with the people at the Science Foundation that in spite of these slightly negative reviews, they funded us. The whole project was governed by uh, the idea of introducing computing to everybody on the Dartmouth campus, or nearly everybody. To that end, uh, what we had to do was to make a computer system that was easy to use for everybody, easy to use, and of course that meant time sharing. We also had to invent a computer programming language that was also easy to learn and easy to use and that, of course, was basic. I expected, and I think others expected, that ALGOL 30 would become the language used at, at Dartmouth. Uh, but this turned out not to be the case. Kennedy didn't like ALGOL. And I know I looked at uh, two of the languages that were around at the time and, and uh, with the idea of making simplified subsets of those languages that could be used for our project. And I couldn't do it, because if you made them simpler, they weren't it was a different language. So at an early stage there, Kemeny was thinking in um, a different direction. I quickly came to the decision that Kemeny was right, we needed a new language. So I was coming at it from the standpoint of somebody intensely interested in undergraduate education, and his skill was simplifying things so that it could be understood by ordinary people. And this is from a different context, but I remember a talk he gave later on when I was on the faculty at Dartmouth, the topic of the alumni college that summer was, where have all the heroes gone? John gave a one hour lecture on his hero, Albert Einstein. I put an outline of my lecture on the blackboard for you, in case you're taking notes. Uh, <laughs> those are the five parts of my lecture. And the lecture started out with him reminiscing about what it was like when he was in the graduate school at Princeton and what Einstein was like as a person, and what it was like to work for Einstein, and weaving in things about his days at Los Alamos and stuff like that. And then he started to say, well, Einstein, of course, is noted for the theory of relativity. Of course, everybody knows the equation equals mc squared. And this was getting to be about halfway through the hour lecture. And then he started doing a little bit more, saying, well, let's look at this a little more carefully. Where, where did he come up with an idea like this from? In about 40 minutes into the hour lecture, I get this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach that John is about set to try to prove equals mc squared to a group of Dartmouth alumni who know no mathematics. And lo and behold, he pulls it off. <laughs> he somehow isolated out the essential parts of it and put it in a language that people could understand. You came out of there thinking that you could have proved it yourself. That, of course, is Einstein's single most best-known result. But John was convinced that things could be made simple, and that's the real origin of BASIC. So we're getting involved in this project, and he probably thought to himself, I'll bet I could write a compiler. You know, a compiler is a big program, 3,000 lines of code. I'll bet I could write a compiler. And he could, and so he did. And uh, he started that in, the, in, I think, the summer of 1963. And he hired uh, a young man from the Tuck School, a t young Tuck School student named Bill Zani, to do some test running on it. He'd wake up at 3 or 4 a.m. and work uh, two hours doing the programming. And he would come in with the code, and I'd meet him at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, he would go over it with me, and it would be handwritten. I would then have to uh, put into punch cards uh, that code to be read into um, the uh, GE computer in Lynn. And if any computer scientist were to take a look at that compiler, it was hard to understand hard to maintain, only somebody with John's brilliance could have controlled the beast of that complexity and made it work. <laughs> <laughs>
During that summer, we got a lot of it working, but there was still a lot of problems with it. But the first time that uh, I thought it was working successfully was when we could enter in a, a, a halfway decent sized program and get the results we anticipated. And I can tell you for sure, I was the first man to see basic run. My, my claim to fame. I had a, a, a scholarship, uh, but as part of the scholarship was a scholarship where you had to do something uh, useful to the college uh, during the, the academic year. So my freshman year, I ended up working in the library, the math library, which meant sitting behind a desk and doing nothing. So it wasn't bad, but it wasn't very interesting. And so the next year, again, I can't remember what the list was of things that I could choose, but one of them was, or you could work on this computer project, which caused me to ask, what's a computer? There was a meeting. Mike Bush was there, John McGeechee was there, I was there, and Tom handed out um, manuals for the DataNet 30. So we had each had to write um, some actual code as part of the exam to see how well we did. Um, Mike had some sort of programming experience, so he wrote by far the best DataNet 30 executive program for scanning the, the serial lines. Um, and ever after, he was the DataNet 30 uh, programmer. And so we were learning uh, how to write or build uh, what became called an operating system. They didn't have one. Uh, I don't think anybody had one at that, that point. So we were, that, that was what building the Dartmouth time sharing system meant. Some of my earliest memories of the project are Tom Kurtz had a couple of memos. Memo number zero was a memo on memos. And then memo number one was procedures for the time sharing system, in which he laid out a lot of the principles, including wherever there was a choice between simplicity and another approach, take the simple approach. The uh, computer arrived something, I think it was in February of 1964, and the uh, two students who were writing the operating systems for the computers, Mike Bush and John McGahey, had a real computer to work with. Working on the code long before the computer arrives is, is actually quite hard to do, because you don't really know if it's going to work. It helps to have some other people around that might be experts, but we didn't have much in the way of experts at that time. So there was a lot of hand coding and hand analysis that went on. Um, when the computers came, then it became real. It took the G engineers maybe a month to get it all up and running, and then we were on it. In the sense that the undergraduates who were part of the student assistantship program basically had priority of access to the machine. I mean, it, it was, for all intents and purposes, it was our machine, which we shared with John Kemeny. I remember in the basement of College Hall handing Professor Kemeny a card deck, my basic program. He running it through the card reader at the console of the GE225. And then together we would go over to look at the printer. He hoping that his basic compiler did the right thing, me hoping that my basic program did the right, you know, calculation, and it was uh, a glorious experience. The whole time-sharing system revolved around the DataNet 30 and the G235 sort of talking to each other on, on, on a very frequent basis. They weren't really built to do what we had in mind. There was nothing built to do what we had in mind. I spent an extraordinary number of hours uh, at College Hall trying, trying to make things work. At the time, we didn't know that this was supposed to be impossible. We didn't know how, or I didn't know how revolutionary this would have, it was going to be. Kimini and Kurtz clearly had, you know, some vision, but I as a freshman and then sophomore was just, you know, this is fun. May 1st, of course, is a, is a, is a signal date in, in all of this. John uh, McGahey and Mike Bush were uh, working on the operating system for the GE hardware, which involved the operating system for two separate computers, 
and a storage device which was, which was accessed by both of them. It was quite a complicated thing that it had to do. And um, the basic compiler had already been written by John Kennedy and was part of this mix, but John Begay and Mike Bush didn't have to work with that. They just had to use it. So on May 1st, uh, or overnight, they were working all night, and we say 4 a.m. in the morning, we don't know really what it was, that's a wild guess. What happened was they got the operating system to work running a simple basic program on separate teletype machines at the same time. So we call it the birth of basic, but it, it would be just as legitimate to say it's the birth of DTSS, the Dartmouth time sharing system. What really happened on May 1st was a, a clear proof of concept, a clear demonstration that all the work that had gone into the, the thinking about whether or not one could actually share a machine among several people, the thinking about whether this simple language would work, all of that was proved correct. And then from then on, it was merely a matter of improving it, expanding it, making it reliable. In the fall of uh, 64, we were invited to make a presentation at AFIPS. It was a big deal of computer people in San Francisco. There was a room of maybe uh, 2,000 people in the room. We hooked up the uh, acoustic coupler on with the handset and we linked the, the uh, the uh, Model 33 teletype to Hanover. We got the dial tone, and all of this was videotaped on the screen for the audience. And we were entering programs uh, in it, and lo and behold, out comes the answers and shown on the screen. And everybody went bananas on this simple, basic, language being compiled and run in San Francisco over ordinary telephone lines in the computers in College Hall in Hanover. And uh, we were bombarded with uh, questions of, of what it was. And that's the first time I really got to, to see the impact of what the Dartmouth time sharing had. We had taken a fairly expensive computer that could only be used by one person at a time and converted it into something where it wasn't just 30 users who could use it, it was 30 undergraduate students using this computer simultaneously, writing programs, getting answers quickly. It was a combination of immediacy and simplicity that had not previously existed. I know Kemeny was pushing everybody to, you know, in their beginning math classes to um, uh, do something with the computer. will be the solution of a quintic or fifth degree equation. This is particularly interesting because... If this had been built on a language like Algol or Fortran, instead of teaching students in two or three hours how to use BASIC, one would have spent easily a full week trying to have them understand Algo and Fortran, and a lot of students would have just lost interest. Writing this program in BASIC is your next assignment. So this was the first, to my understanding, large-scale effort in undergraduate education for computing. Today, approximately 85% of all Dartmouth undergraduates make use of the computer. Students in more than 100 courses, ranging from the sciences and mathematics through economics, education, and psychology, to languages and sociology, make direct use of the system in completing course assignments. So we had many different faculty members in many departments who were doing more and more. Instructor Waite is also using the computer in the study of Latin poetry and prose style, as well as preparing elementary exercises in beginning Latin. I would say that it was um, 
Certainly a revolution for people that were involved in it because people could actually get things done. People would come up with their own idea. Hey, I have a computer and I have a right to use that computer and I can use it for anything I want and they would. Very quickly after the DARPA time sharing system became available, people were making games. That's, <laughs> it was a leading sign of what was gonna happen. Kemeny wrote a program that emulated football uh, that would run on the computer. It was very popular with the students because uh, you could sit there and call the plays. You could pick simple run, tricky run, uh, short pass, long pass, punt. Somewhere during the game, there'd be a dog on the field who'd come out. <laughs> yeah, the game would have to be delayed. It had nothing to do with the game, but that always happened at a real football game, so we put it in there. It turned out that an awful lot of the terminal side getting more use because lots of students heard this is a great football game. Cubic was another one. It's, uh, you have a three-dimensional tic-tac-toe on a 4x4x4 four by four by four board. People would keep writing programs for that. And we did, didn't care what the students did with it. And they did a lot of interesting things, I'm sure, that we never heard of. In the fall of 1964, Kemeny, I think, was on the school board of Hanover High School. They arranged for Hanover High School to have a teletype. We learned pretty quickly that high school students were just as eager and just as good as undergraduates at writing programs. We grow up, I think, as the first computer kids, you know, kids who had computers accessible on demand. Then before you knew it, it was, you need to know something about computing, ask your kid. Pretty soon we had hundreds of users. There was a big phone company problem and they had to add new trunk lines into the town of Hanover. Colleges throughout New England bought time on the Dartmouth time sharing system on the 235 system that was running in the basement of College Wall and later in the computer center. The interesting thing about the architecture of it, it was designed uh, to hold a big computer. So there was a big central computer room with glass doors at the front and the back so everybody would come in and see this wonderful computer machine sitting there. And I, I can remember tours coming through Kiwit, you know, the admission tours pointing out that this was the, the largest computer in the world. You could see through the, the glass. Um, I also had heard that that Kiwit was, was third on the Kremlin's list right after the Pentagon in Sac Omaha, that the big tree outside Kiwit and the round planting tipped up. That was the missile silo. I once estimated that even before Bill Gates got into the action at all, five million people in the world knew how to write programs in BASIC. There were something like 80 time-sharing systems in the United States that offered BASIC as one of their languages, and it was all over the world. I even got a letter from somebody in Siberia. A student in Siberia wrote me a letter once. This is before Gates, BG. Um, you no, know, I was here when Kiwit was built, and I was there when they tore it down. So. I was kind of sorry to realize that I had not only outlived an operating system, I outlived a building. Looking forward 20 years, I'm quite certain that the coming of the computer will have a significant effect on all businesses and most private lives. Whether these effects will be fully favorable, as they could be, or in part harmful, will depend on whether those who make policy decisions are aware of whether com what computers can do and what they cannot do. There's a couple of things that make the story of Dartmouth time sharing and BASIC interesting. Uh, first of all, it was the first effort in the history of computing to try to bring computing and make it simpler and bring it to the masses so that the masses could use it. Kimini was amazing, a visionary. He had a view of where we all ought to be computer literate before most of us even realized that computers existed. The second thing that was interesting about it was it was all done by undergraduate students. Nowhere else do I know of in the history of computing has 
something like this been done. As I grew up and, and worked in organizations, I realized that this was the most incredible example of what's called an aligned team. I've had a few super teams in my career, but looking back on it, that Dartmouth team is probably the most incredible experience, particularly considering it was entirely undergraduates. Oh, the third thing is, it was done at Dartmouth. I hope it's uh, the, the thousands of students I have taught and the contribution I made to their education uh, has to be my number one contribution. Uh, secondly, uh, things I did to bring Dartmouth to the forefront of computing, uh, which I hope is a contribution both to Dartmouth and indirectly to the nation. Kemeny was very helpful to me in my um, last year at Dartmouth. I took a course from him. The night before the final exam, I found out by telephoning my mother that my father had died that day. Kemeny spoke to me and said that I should skip the final exam and uh, take it in the summer. And that all worked out all right. But then there was a question of the money. So my father having died, there was no money, neither for tuition nor for room. Well, Kemeny wrote letters to the appropriate officials at Dartmouth, and I was given a scholarship for $1,000 and a loan, offer of a loan. In addition, somehow magically, I got an offer from Bob and Anita Norman of free rent in their basement. Meanwhile, uh, in 1962, Tom had hired a secretary for the summer, and that secretary ended up as my wife, Susan. Kemeny found out that Susan did not complete the requirements for graduation from the University of Maryland. And he arranged for her to be accepted by the summer school. And as you may know, summer schools like to make money. They don't give away free anything. I think Kemeny paid the tuition himself. <laughs>